some of the work that I've been doing here at CSU has been in high tunnels, and we've got about six years under our belts now. And it's um, come about primarily because of interest among growers that we're looking for ways to extend season, um, to produce throughout the season, certainly through the summer, without any additional energy going into greenhouses. So this is sort of a, an inexpensive alternative to a greenhouse with a lot of the same benefits. In our climate where we have a whole lot of wind, um, a little bit of wind break or mitigation there can change the crop performance significantly. And that microclimate enhancement is something that we've been looking at a lot this last year. We've taken that a few steps past just wind protection by increasing relative humidity and um, decreasing solar exposure on plants through shading. Another benefit, especially at the ends of the season where we're looking at about 120 day growing season is we can extend that season very easily a month in each direction just by having covers over our crops. And very importantly, hail protection. Um, anybody that's grown field crops here knows that probably every year you'll have at least one hail event. This year was probably one of the first that we didn't get hail out at the Hort Farm. Um, other years it's really been devastating. But these um, high tunnels are, are good protection against hail protection. And also depending upon the type of material you're using on your tunnels, you can mitigate insect vector diseases on a lot of crops. Um, here we have tomato spotted wilt virus. This year was a terrible year for tomato growers up and down the front range. And that's vectored by the thrips, the western flower thrips. We also have curly top virus, which is a real significant problem on the front range as well as on the western slope, and that's vectored by the western beet leaf hopper. Um, cucumber beetle vectors bacterial wilt, and potato psyllids also are really significant on tomato crops. And so if we can keep those off of our crops and keep the hail off, we're pretty much guaranteed of a, of a production. When, um, if they're in the field, you may not have that good luck. And these buildings, these high tunnels, are really pretty inexpensive to put up. And they're really, um, they have many different uses in them. Or you can use them for, well, we'll, we'll talk about a variety of the different uses here. On the flip side, there's some challenges, and crop scheduling is one thing. If you're trying to squeeze three or four or five crops out of a, a small piece of land instead of one or two, how do you identify the, the cropping season, seasons and what crops you can grow during those periods? Um, they're also light buildings, and here we have lots of wind, and these can be big kites if they're not anchored properly. So wind damage can be really problematic. If you get a disease into this structure, um, primarily a soil-borne disease, because we're trying to reuse the same land, and most of the growers are growing in the soil. So if, we, if we're not able to rotate our crops effectively, then there's potential for some disease problems. Temperature management is another area, and most of these structures traditionally are roll-up sides where the plastic roofs are rolled up to ventilate the, the high tunnels. And they can get very hot in the summertime. And so we've been looking at methods to change the performance of the temperatures in these greenhouses or high tunnels. And even though you can exclude pests, you can also exclude some of the beneficials that you may have flying around, which include pollinators for your pollinated fruit crops and um, certainly beneficial predatory and parasitic insects. If they're excluded from a crop, but you introduce aphids or thrips or other pests, when you transplant into them, you may complicate the problem. And they do cost something, even though they're relatively inexpensive. If you're comparing field production to these, you're looking at less than a dollar per square foot of production costs versus two to three dollars for a, for a production cost in a high tunnel. So what are they? They're really varied. People build them in a lot of different ways for different purposes. 
Um, they can be very similar to a regular greenhouse structure like this greenhouse that, um, or high tunnel that Lynn McGuire is growing strawberries in, in columns in, or they can be lower structures like this short tunnel over raspberries in New Mexico, or really quite big structures like Tim has over his tomatoes out in Strasburg. Generally, they're high enough to stand in and work comfortably. Um, they may be high enough to trellis crops, like these tomatoes are trellised, or raspberries are, can be quite tall. Lynn's strawberry tunnel or towers are about six, for eight, six or seven feet tall. Um, they can be round, they can be angular and sort of a gutter connected style. They're generally 12 to 20 feet wide, but they can be as long as you want them. It's practically a question of how long your roll of plastic is that you're going to cover them with. But in general, they're less than 96 feet long. That's a sort of an industry standard. Some of them are movable. These tunnels in North Carolina are on um, wooden sleds, so they can actually slide the tunnel over a piece of land after it's been prepared and after it's been planted, but before the crop is actually up. There's a close-up of those sleds that they put four people on it and they can slide the greenhouse right over a, a new position in the field. Um, there are more and more people putting in these multi-bay tunnels that are up to 30 acres in size. They're quite large. And um, there's a Haygrove company in, out of England that's introduced these to the state several years ago and, and there are a lot of these being put up in the Midwest. They offer a taller structure which with higher, greater volume in a tunnel, um, there's less temperature fluctuation and they're less expensive per, per square foot to put up large areas. And this is another low tunnel style. Just to use over raspberries where they're trying to stretch that season out a little bit longer. This is in the Embudo area near north of Santa Fe and it's down in the bottom of a, of a valley, probably the coldest place that you could get there because the cold air drops down into it. And by having these covered they're starting to produce probably in late August there, and their first frosts are probably coming in in the first part of September, so they have a really narrow window without season extension using these high tunnels. They can be very versatile, and over at Osage Greenhouse in um, Newcastle, they use these tunnels to overwinter sort of sensitive crops in the wintertime, and they'll put shade over them, they'll hang their irrigation systems off of them, and they'll also use some insect netting to, to keep insects off of these crops. And more recently, I think um, Elliot Coleman is probably credited with this, but these are, I at least in the States, because it's actually a Spanish style tunnel, but these are called caterpillar tunnels. And I don't have a good picture of it, but if you look at it from the side at a distance, it looks like a um, polymorphous caterpillar that has really angular body and um, that's because these ropes are used to tie the plastic down. The plastic is just sitting on top of the tunnel and the ropes are holding it down and you can slide the sides of the plastic up under the rope to ventilate or pull it down in the evening to, to um, capture heat. And they're also, they're very inexpensive, quick to put up and really easy to move as well. This is one that we just put up out at the Hort Farm um, where we're extending the season on raspberry production, similar to what we were doing or what you saw in that last slide in New Mexico. And let's see, Sarah helped put this up. We, we got it up, most of it in about a day, I think. Um, put some posts in the ground and bend the pipe up over the top and then throw some plastic over the top of it. And these are sandbags that we've used to hold the plastic down. And we've had some really high winds out there and it hasn't blown away yet. So it did afford us probably a month of protection after the first good freeze we had out of the farm. So these raspberries have been producing until 
Monday or so when we had that seven degree um, night. So in terms of what goes into them, you can buy kits. These are bent metal tubing. Um, that's what most people are doing. And they're either metal or they're square or round tubing. Um, I've built many of them just out of electrical conduit, bent around a horse trough to get the curve in it or a, some sort of jig. Um, people are using PVC pipe. And PVC pipe works well as long as you paint it so that it doesn't break down in the sunlight over, over time. And roll-up sides are installed any number of ways. We started out our work at the Hort Farm with a grant from the Organic Farming Research Foundation and to look specifically at insect mitigation using high tunnels. And so this is an opportunity to not only to see what materials worked well for keeping insects out, but also looking at climate under those tunnels in terms of how well they breathed, um, how well they ventilated, how hot they got, um, and also humidity and things like that in the tunnels. So we used a, a conventional poly, which is a greenhouse plastic, um, which we know performs well in this climate, but it holds a lot of heat. And then PVA is a polyvinyl alcohol. It's called Tough Bell in the trade. And that has some very good light as well as ventilation properties. Um, it's long lived as long as you can get the seams to hold together because it only comes in 83 inch widths. And so I sew sewed them together and about, well, in September, the thread that I used broke down in the sun, so it started coming apart. But and then I used some floating row cover or fleece, it's also called in the trade. And that's just a, a spun bond polyester material. And this, the fleece made a very nice climate. It held moisture in, humidity in, kept the wind off, but it did ventilate. But it didn't hold up in the real high winds that we have. Other people are using aluminet, which is a reflective material, and that's especially interesting for insect mitigation because thrips and psyllids are repelled by it very effectively. Um, shade cloth works really well for cooling a crop or, or keeping it relatively cool th during the summertime. And we're using conventional greenhouse systems to attach the roofs. This is uh, an extruded aluminum track with what's called wiggle wire. It's a stiff wire that um, pinches the, the glazing material onto the track, which is then screwed onto the wood structure. And here we're putting a plastic cover on top of it. So these were the different treatments in our insect exclusion trial. Something that I think is a little bit confusing for people, they, they assume that they can put a greenhouse up and it will withstand the elements pretty well. But they're not engineered structures. So these aren't like a greenhouse that you would buy that is able to hold 40 or 60 pounds per square foot of snow in, in May when, it, when we get one of those early summer, early spring snowfalls. Um, nor are they strong enough to technically hold up a, a dead load of, of fruit or of um, hanging baskets. And if you want all that strength, you're probably going to be paying 25 to $60 a square foot for a, a <coughs> structure that's engineered. But these tunnels are running less than a dollar a square foot up to about $3 a square foot. So there's a huge difference in price, but you're really getting a, a different product entirely. And you can, mit you can get away with some of these cheaper alternatives by decreasing the width between your ribs, by making the roofs steeper instead of flatter. Um, so there are a number of different design features that you can include. And if you don't, this can be one of the results. And these two snow load um, pictures were from a collaborator we had in Cortez last year who, who lost her tunnels to 
to a snow load. I think they'd just gone outside to sweep them off, and um, as they were going out, they started dropping. And this picture is from a friend in Kansas where they're doing high tunnel work, and they had a micro burst go through there, and this is a polyethylene, I mean a, a PVC um, tunnel here that's completely destroyed, but even some of their metal high tunnels were knocked down in that wind. Of course, you have to ventilate them. These don't have fans in them, like greenhouses. And so people are using roll-up sides or some pretty innovative um, windows that flip. And some of these windows have um, expansion openers that are just wax openers that expand and contract different temperatures and allow the, the tunnels to ventilate themselves so that you don't have to be there every hour while the sun's up during the daytime. I think I've mentioned a little bit about the costs. Um, these are a few years old. I think it's probably doubling those prices to about two to three dollars a square foot it costs to build these. So they're, they're very inexpensive. Certainly site selection's critical in deciding where to put your tunnel and the soil to start with. You're going to be growing in the ground, probably. So if you have a salty patch out in your pasture that you can't grow anything on, that's not where you want to put your tunnel. Um, it should be well-drained and, and productive soils. Um, irrigation water that you have available needs to be high quality. And water analysis is really important, as well as availability of water. Orientation, I think wind is probably the biggest um, concern here in our latitude. Some people say, well, if I turn it east or west or east or north, does it um, change the amount of light penetration that I get? And I think it's pretty well established that around our 40 degrees, it doesn't make that much difference in terms of light. But it does make a big difference in terms of wind. And we'll have strong winds out of the north, but the real howlers come directly out of the west. And so we direct our tunnels that way. And I mentioned earlier that if you're in the mountains, and a lot of small acreage producers are up in the mountains, and they're trying to be farmers there, and if they're putting their tunnels down in the bottom of the valleys, that's where that cold air drains to, and they have the, the probably the, the least, um, least usable growing season in the, in the bottom of a cold, cold valley. And then year-round access is something else. I've tried to visit some friends with tunnels up in west of Laramie, and you couldn't get to it because the snow was um, blown in from windbreaks, and they couldn't open the doors because they were all snowed in. And so I think having access to um, foot traffic as well as water and tools is really important. In terms of preparing the tunnels after they're built, um, our tunnels, you can take the ends off and you can drive a tractor through six tunnels at once and do tillage that way. That's how we laid our black plastic when we were laying individual rows of black plastic in them. Um, tractor access facilitates a lot of operations, obviously. Um, this farmer was also doing tractor tillage and just moving the tunnel into place. So they would do their tillage outside and then move the tunnel onto it. And um, Clara Coleman up in, out of Silt was doing the same thing. These are, these are mobile tunnels and they move on metal tracks with wheels. And so she could prepare beds and move her, her tunnels onto them. She also has some low tunnels here um, with floating row cover over them and was actually growing greens in those all year, all winter long. This is visiting the same site in February or March with our greenhouse class. I think you were on that trip, Noemi. And it was a howling cold day. Um, but these tunnels were producing great crops right through the winter. She did use some additional heat in these tunnels just to keep things above freezing. So in terms of the, some of the work that we've been doing um, 
initially I mentioned we, we started with an OFRF grant to, to evaluate mitigation of insect diseases, insect vector diseases, um, and also look at the climate and durability of some of these other materials. So we compared, I mentioned the polyethylene, the polyvinyl, spun bond polyester, and also an insect screening econet, which is, um, it comes in, in, in a number of different thicknesses, or um, the screen openings come in a variety of different sizes for different pests that you're trying to exclude. And this product that we used is actually big enough to let a thrips through, but the thrips don't like to go through it because it's, it's a reflective surface, and so they don't bother it too much. So it afforded us good ventilation, but still um, protection from wind and capturing a, a little bit of heat. And in this first trial, we grew melons and tomatoes and Napa cabbage and spinach. And it was through the middle of the summer, and I was surprised, and a lot of people were surprised, at the quality of the Napa, which is a cool season crop, and spinach, in it, as, which is a cool season crop, in these hot, hot tunnels during the summer. But they performed beautifully, and I think that's because the, the vapor pressure deficit on these plants was low. It was a very humid environment, so it allowed them to tolerate those high temperatures, even though the crops were ill-suited for that time of year. Um, basically, take-home messages from that trial were that it did exclude insects very effectively. We didn't have psyllids or thrips vector diseases, as did our field crops during that summer. Um, the floating rug cover was the, by far the least expensive, but we had to replace it because it blew off. Um, and so we lost our <laughs> insect protection at that point, clearly. The really bright polyvinyl alcohol material, um, if we could find a good way to hold that material together with seaming, with um, some better method to hold the seams together, it would have been a great material. It performed very well. The insect screening, the Econet, was the most expensive, but probably gave us the nicest climate. And we've been using that material for years and years afterwards. It's held up really well. And then, of course, polyethylene, which is the standard, requires a lot of ventilation. Um, the crops get very hot, and they dry out because you raise your sides, and that also allows the insects in. But I think the crops we were growing yielded the highest under those roll-up side tunnels because we had really good pollination activity, whereas the other ones didn't. So that was a that still is something I, I need to, to look at is um, growing, growing fruit crops in closed tunnels with pollinators introduced, which we haven't done that yet. We monitored temperature and relative humidity in all these. And as you might expect, the maximum temperatures in the tunnels were higher than the ambient. Um, but the averages between the different treatments were really quite tight. And then this only ran into November, but there wasn't very much difference between the materials. There were a few degrees differences um, when it really got down into the cold temperatures. This was the same data. These are just the differences between materials. And the polyethylene, which is the plastic, um, and the insect screening, we had five to 10 degrees difference um, during some cold snaps we had in October. So there was um, benefit that the polyethylene provided that the screening didn't there. So growers are, that are interested in using tunnels, of course, are wondering what they should grow or can grow. And of course, that's going to depend on the market demand for any product and what you can grow in them. Um, so we've defined that by seasonality with early season production, um, what you can squeeze in there to get into the marketplace early and, and get, get your foot in the door, so to speak, 
I think that's something that growers have a lot of problems with when they're growing seasonally. They'll be in and out of a market. So if you go to the grocery store and say, I have beautiful melons, and you have them for a month, and then he doesn't see you for 11 months, you have to reestablish yourself over and over again. So if they can maintain some continuity between the relationships they have with their markets and products that you have, whether it's the same product or a variety of products, that's a huge advantage. So we're trying to get things to fit into those off seasons so that they can maintain a, um, a foot in that marketplace. Obviously, you've got the added expense of, of these structures, so you need to be making that up by, the, by what you decide to grow. Um, our experience thus far has been that tomatoes are really far ahead in terms of returns on summer crops. We can get high production, and by growing the right varieties where there's a market demand for them, we can fetch a uh, good return there. And then in the winter, salad greens, of course, we can grow, and you can get very good yields of really high quality greens um, throughout the cool season. So those are probably the areas that we're going to focus on. But in Michigan and up in Oregon, they've had a lot of luck with berry production in tunnels. And so I think that's something that's needing to be looked at more here. Um, during the summer, we've also looked at cucumbers and peppers, yard long beans, okra, and then we've done some strange demonstrations. Um, years ago, when I was working in the greenhouse, there was this Belgian grower that was telling me that their hydroponic systems were originally in straw, and so they used straw bales that they would put in the greenhouses, throw some compost on it, let them heat up, and do some composting, let them cool back down, and then they'd plant their cucumbers or tomatoes into it. And then they would just irrigate those not quite soilless, but almost soilless um, systems. And I've always wanted to try that. So we, we got some hay bales and off of the property at the farm and threw some compost on top of them and let them heat up. And they started to cool down. We planted our strawberries. And I came back in after the weekend and opened the greenhouse up and almost knocked me over with, with the ammonium that had been produced as those continued to, to compost. And of course, it killed all of our strawberries. But we replanted after that, and they did beautifully. I just jumped again on it. We tried some blueberries in um, <coughs> peat media in the tunnels. And that was after we'd done some work in greenhouses showing that we could force blueberries in the middle of the winter by bringing them into the greenhouse and, and heating them up. Um, did a few cut flowers. Based on experience of other growers that I know that have had really good luck with flowers and tunnels, where they get reduction of wind and light and they get really good stretch on a lot of the, on the cut flowers, which is a desirable trait for a lot of varieties. Um, we didn't pay enough attention to that crop. And then culinary herbs we've also grown in the high tunnels. Tomatoes have been our main focus, though. And you can see by the size of that leaf there, um, this is an extreme variety, but this heirloom variety produces these big potato-type leaves. And with a little higher humidity and less wind on them, they become really vegetative and beautiful plants and produce some really nice fruit as well. Um, we've trialed dozens of, of different varieties. And some of the problems with the heirloom types, it's a perennial problem, I think, with those varieties. There's a lot of cracking in them. So this last year, we focused a lot of our effort on altering the microclimate so that we should get less russeting and, and cracking on the top of the tomatoes. Um, I think we've made some headway there. Haven't defined it completely, but we're headed in the right direction. And I think that'll be something for somebody to continue with in the future. Another problem with those heirlooms is we'll get two or three trusses of fruit that set very well, 
and then the plant just kind of quits for three or four trusses and then it'll start producing again later in the season. Um, so I'm not too sure how much of that is environmental and how much of it's genetic or if we can tweak the environment to kick it back into production earlier, but it's been a problem consistently. Tomatoes or cucumbers have done very well and we're growing, we've grown a number of different varieties, the European style as well as some of the Middle Eastern, um, more of a pickling style cucumber. But we have run into some problems with soil borne diseases and certainly found which varieties were susceptible to verticillium or fusarium rather and powdery mildew and which varieties claim to be powdery mildew resistant um, they're probably just tolerant they may be covered with with spores like this but they tend to produce anyway I think this is lemon cucumber and it just is covered with, with powdery mildew but it still does not quit growing cucumbers um, this is Mike Dooley, he's a tomato grower in, in Firestone, and this is our tunnel where we're growing some of his peppers. He's a, he's a seed provider for um, Syngenta. So we've been trialing some of their varieties. Peppers have done beautifully in the tunnels. And in Colorado where we have a real problem with sunburn fruit because of the high light intensity on our crop, tunnels have been um, really productive. We haven't had nearly the losses of, of sun scalded fruit. So that's, if you're a pepper grower, I think tunnels are probably the way to go in Colorado, at least on small scale market production. Nothing that Mark, Mike Bartolo would try to do on 50 acres, I don't think. Uh, they're, they're fun crop to grow though. There's a lot of variety in color and flavor. These are their strawberries and these are the hay bales that we put in and planted. And you can see there's a little bit of chlorosis going on there, Harrison. We, I expected these to be a low <coughs> pH growing system. But do you know what the leachate on, on these were? We were drip irrigating through that hay bale. It was 8.5 coming out of those. So but we still managed to produce some good strawberries. That was um, seascape variety. And then I think what interests me the most and a lot of growers I think is at least if they're not sick of markets by the time the snow flies and a lot of them don't want anything to do with extending the season. They're done with it and glad to take the rest. But is this winter production I think has a lot of potential and has proven itself to be viable, certainly. And so we've done um, three projects looking at, at winter production, starting out with a Western SARE project that Matt Espy worked on, looking at a, a screening of a lot of different varieties of lettuce and Asian greens and evaluating temperatures under floating row cover in the high tunnels. And then um, following up with a, another Western SARE project with multiple growers around the state and um, an NRCS project, was, which is a demonstration of year-round production, which was summer as well as winter production systems. But we found that we can alter our climate without any added heat to these tunnels just with a high tunnel and some floating row cover over your, over your crop, we can change our climate zones from Fort Collins down to more of an Austin, Texas zone. And that's in the middle of January and February. We don't get the day length that they have, but the temperatures under those row covers are, are similar to what they see in Austin. Um, in our first year, we covered crops with a single layer of floating row cover or else we put two layers on it or we had no cover at all. And these are the temperatures again under the different treatments. And what we're really interested in were the low temperatures of course. And these, I think I might have, yeah. So these two lines here 
Um, are the two different floating row cover treatments where you have one and two layers. And on the very coldest temperatures, when the ambient temperature was 10, 15 below zero, we were just around 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And that sounds too cold for most crops, but a lot of these lettuces and Asian greens will handle 20 degrees quite nicely. Um, they'll be brittle when you go in in the morning and they can snap, but give them a couple of hours in the light and they're turgid again and undamaged and perfectly harvestable. But something that we also found was, well, th these top slides, this is our uncovered trial, and this is the one of two layers of, of floating row cover over the top of it. Um, it's the end of January, and these had been sown in November. But something that we didn't like about the decreased light that we saw under those different layers, when you had two layers, we got very big, soft leaves, really stretched. That's Yukina, it's an Asian green. And that's not something that you're able to market. It won't hold up. It's um, very fragile. So I think the intermediate with a single layer of floating row cover allows enough light. It still gives it protection. And um, the, the leaf is in a condition that's marketable. There's really dramatic differences. And then on this other project was where we were working with um, six growers around the state, and we duplicated the, the same trials at each location, and they were interested in looking at which crops did best, which planting blocks worked best for them, because they were curious to know if they could plant in October or November or December or January when they would get best production, and if they could maintain good production through all of those different periods of time. And by looking at the different areas around the state, we had different climates and um, different weather conditions. Sorry. So we had two sites up in Fort Collins, one in Boulder. Um, the picture that you saw up at Divide Creek um, out of Silt, Colorado, up at about 8,000 feet. Zephyrus Farm over near Peonia, and then um, Becky's farm down in Dolores. And we grew carrots and lettuce and mosh, radishes and spinach. And everybody had the same planting design and planting dates. Everything was replicated. They all used the same type of planters. And then they took harvest data and quality data off of each planting throughout the winter. And this is, I think, pretty um, representative of some spinach that was fall, late fall planted um, 40 days into production. So this is probably mid-December um, crop. These are some radishes that come out in about 47 days in the middle of the winter. Um, so the takeaway message there was, I didn't include all the dates and, and data on that, but the early fall plantings yielded well until about December, and all of the plantings up until about February after that were really too slow to make a go of it. But after you hit that famous February 15th date, um, start planting then, then you'd have really quick production. And, and so there was an opportunity for them to take a little bit of a break in the dead of winter. Um, without any additional heat. And the cro crops would grow, but just not um, efficiently enough. So things that I still think are worth looking at are really tuning in on the varieties um, and the scheduling of, of when to plant those varieties for year-round production. Maybe adding some active systems into the high tunnels, such as hot water, heat through beds with tubing, um, you could do that inexpensively and, and it would really change the system. We've got a grower here in Fort Collins doing that, um, actually with air, not with hot water, but a, a simple, very low 
energy requiring system to heat beds to keep the soil temperature up and keep um, active plant growth. Looking at different materials for insulating the tunnels themselves so that we can capture heat during the daytime and really button them down at night. They're doing a lot of this in Japan with um, materials that they'll throw over the top of or pull up under the, under the um, structure of the building to make it hold as much heat as possible. Snow load designs, certainly in the mountains, and a lot of people are wanting to, to grow in the mountains if they have a ski town market available to them, or if they're doing year-round CSAs, which a lot of people are doing, they need to have a structure that'll hold up to the weather. Um, we've gotten started on this microclimate management using shading as well as misting on these tunnels. So we actually have water that's um, applied to the top of the tunnel to cool the structure or to go through a screen type tunnel to increase humidity in the inside and we I haven't put that data together but it's it looks pretty promising they're very very different responses in the tunnels to those different treatments so I'd like to continue with the micromanagement of micromanagement of the microclimate um, again varieties and then biocontrol is some of the pests that we do have in tunnels including powdery mildew probably two spotted mite um, on, on cucumbers, but we haven't had too much of a problem with that pest. And also increasing pollination in closed up tunnels. And this is technology that's used in greenhouses all the time that wouldn't be difficult for a small grower to use in high tunnels. So I'm Confident to say that tunnels work in Colorado. They're really um, inexpensive to build. The gross returns can be quite high, depending on your varietal choices and what season you're marketing into. Um, for winter production, I just bought a $6 bag of salad greens from our local producer here. And I think that she's selling a lot of those out of her little tiny greenhouse. I don't know how many thousands of dollars she's made last month, but I think it's in the thousands. Um, so growing the right, right varieties, getting them in the ground at the right time, and I think it's um, very promising. I've had lots and lots of help. I've had incredible crews working with me. I think we've had about 60 students on these projects over the years, and some of them are doing it on their own now. Um, Sarah's been a big help here, and I don't see anybody else. They must be hard at work, Sarah. But OFRF, Department of Ag, Western SARE, NRCS, Johnny's has been really generous with um, giving us discounts and free seed, as have other seed providers. And Mike Dooley down in, in Longmont is the tomato grower and seed purveyor, and all around um, greenhouse and high tunnel consultant. He knows a lot about it. So, have any questions? Be glad to. Here are a couple of really good resources. There's a lot of information on high tunnels now. I think Atra is probably one of the better ones. That's um, in CAT. They have a lot on small scale farming systems. Um, Pennsylvania State who's really the beginner of high tunnel work in, in the states has done a lot and then Elliot Coleman that picture of the tunnels up in you know silts is Clara Coleman's or was Clara Coleman's farm and that's her dad that's written all these books and I think of any um, manuals that are out there on the market, he probably does the best job of anybody. These are a few other good sources of information. If you're interested, I can share these with you.